All right, there's a lot going on in this video, so bear with me, please. First of all, we're gonna be reviewing, sort of reviewing three different products at the same time. Also, this is a new set where I have three different cameras running. I'm not that experienced yet with using this set. I'm gonna give you a, a full tour of this probably like early to mid September, but for now, you'll get some little sneak previews on it. I've got a bunch of information to disclose, which we'll get into right now. So this is about two Sony cameras and a lens. We've got the A7C2, the A7CR, and the new 16 to 35 G Master II. Now when it comes to the disclosure part, as usual, these are just loaners. I don't get to keep them. No money changed hands. Sony doesn't get any input on this video's production. And this video does have an actual sponsor though, and that's Storyblocks. I keep getting confused about which camera to look at. I'm gonna have to get used to that. Um, but then there's also a, an extra bit of disclosure here that I wanna be open and transparent about. I believe that these products are gonna be launched at Sony Condo, which is a sort of press trip kind of getaway thing that Sony runs. So they're gonna be launched there. Now, some people are gonna get the cameras ahead of time, like me, and get to do reviews ahead of time, which is important to me because I, I have sort of an ethics thing where I don't make content at press trips because I find it to be a little bit of a conflict of interest. Now, me knowing that these cameras are also being launched at Condo and the fact that I'm going to Condo could also be a conflict of interest. I just wanna make you fully aware of that. I'm not gonna be making any content at Condo and my opinions are gonna be based on my experience with the cameras before that trip ever took place but decide whether you wanna take anything I have to say to be useful or not. And also, if you can't tell, this video is not scripted. I'm kinda of doing a Gamer's Nexus style. I got my, my sheets of paper here. Uh, but it's gonna be kinda of easy. This is gonna be more of an overview anyway because these cameras aren't exactly new cameras. The A7C2 is an A7 IV and the A7CR is an A7R5. And I already reviewed both of those cameras and those videos are still up, so I recommend you watch them if you wanna go into the deep dives on them. And so today we're just gonna be talking about what's different, what's new, you know, any limitations and stuff like that. Now, these have the same or very, very similar form factor to the A7C, but that camera was modeled after the A7 III. So there's a huge upgrade if you're an A7C owner, going from the A7C to the A7C II, it's actually greater than the upgrade of going from the A7 III to the A7 IV, because in the case of the C2, it's actually slightly better than an A7 IV. Think of that, if you're an A7C user, this is a massive upgrade. If you have an A7 IV, it's kind of a compact lateral move, same with the A7R5. Both of these cameras are almost identical, except for the sensor is different between them. And again, when it comes to that sensor, this is the 33 megapixel sensor that we saw on the A7 IV, and this is the 61 megapixel sensor from the A7R5. But keep in mind that if you're from an A7C, that's still using the old interface, 8-bit, the old menu structure, all that. All these cameras are on the new menu, new interface, 10-bit video, all that kind of stuff. Now, like I said, I'm not going to go back and review those cameras, but I did spend, you know, a week retesting everything like I'm like a moron. I, the dynamic range, the uh, rolling shutter, it's the same. I like, I don't know why. <laughs> I'm not even going to waste your time like going through all the numbers and everything. They're the same. They're the same sensors. They perform the same. Let's talk about what's actually different. So. The smaller body on these means that there's gonna be changes to the input and output. And you know, this might not be foreign to you if you're an A7C shooter, but if you're an A7 IV user and you're like, you know, what, what's gonna be changing? Let's take a look here. Over to angle number three. So you can see all the input and output ports there. So we've got a headphone and microphone jack, which is nice. We've got a USB-C port with power delivery. And we're gonna talk more about that because it's pretty impressive, but only one SD card slot. So no redundant recording in the camera. And then as you can see there, it uses a micro type D HDMI port, which obviously isn't great, but they weren't gonna be able to fit a full size HDMI port on this camera. So if you need that, the A7 IV, like I said, is pretty much the same camera with a full size HDMI port and two SD card slots. When it comes to controls, it's very similar. You actually still get three dials too, which is nice, the one on the rear, the one on the front, and the thumb dial down there. There's no joystick though, so that can be a bit of an annoyance. I think the viewfinder is slightly worse, but the LCD screen is pretty much the same. The bigger difference in the, in the screens is more gonna be with the A7CR, where again, it's just going to your basic flip screen, where the biggest, one of the coolest things about the A7R5 was that multi-way, nine-axis, tilty, flippy, you don't get to have that. And the viewfinder is a massive reduction in quality going to the A7CR from the A7R5. But again, not as big of a deal on the A7C2. And there's obviously quite a bit of a reduction in grip depth, as you can see here. 
It's not bad. I believe it's been improved over the A7C. I don't have an A7C anymore to really compare it to. And you know, it doesn't feel terrible in the hands for a compact camera, but it's definitely not the same grip that you would get from the full-size cameras. Now with the A7CR, it actually comes in the box with this, it's about a finger width thick little grip attachment that you can put on the bottom. It just threads in here like this. And it does actually give you a lot better, you know, more, more place for your pinky and, and it does feel a little bit more firm in the hand. Adds a little bit more weight too, which some people might like. And you can still get at the battery compartment. And interestingly is that it actually balances okay on that thing, even though it's not a very broad point of contact with the surface, but it's not bad. Now this grip can also be used on the A7C2, but it does not come included. And then lastly, when it comes to cosmetics, it's not just that the A7C2 is silver and the A7CR is black. You can get them both in black, both in silver, either or. Uh, both options are available. Now, like I alluded to earlier, there's actually been some improvements to the cameras as well. They're not just smaller with some drawbacks. Both of these with the USB-C port now offer the improved uh, live streaming and webcam functionality codec. So you can go all the way up to 4K30, where the previous cameras like the A7 IV was uh, 1080p60 or 4K15, which is pointless. So now you can do 1080p60 or 4K up to 30, which is actually a significant quality bump. But I do have some notes about that webcam functionality when we get into the overheating. Now, also when it comes to the A7C2, this camera, unlike the A7 IV, now has that AI processing chip. So you're gonna get better subject detection and autofocus. And theoretically bringing this camera above the A7 IV for overall autofocus performance. Stabilization is different and something to consider. So both of these are using the same stabilization now, which is a new IBIS design just for these cameras, which is a slight downgrade from the A7R5, but a slight improvement from the A7 IV. It kind of meets in the middle. They're rated at like seven stops, where the A7R5 was rated at eight, but the A7 IV was rated at 5.5. Improvement from the A7 IV, downgrade from the A7R5. But, uh, but a massive upgrade over an A7C, A7 III, all those other previous cameras. So I'd say that's a win overall, especially because again, from an A7 IV shooter, this is, a, this is an improvement. But you see the trend, right? It's slightly worse than an A7R5, that keeps happening. Now, also the same is true when it comes to burst rates. With the A7C2, it's maintaining 10 frames per second in mechanical and electronic shutter. With the A7R5, it could do 10 frames, but the A7CR has dropped to eight frames per second. I don't exactly know the reason for that, but it does, it is worse when it comes to how quickly you can fire off shots with the A7CR, but it is not worse with the a7c2. Now, both of these new cameras also feature all of the same little bells and whistles that we've seen. You know, we can knock Sony for not doing well in going back and adding firmware upgrades to their previous cameras, which annoy me. But what they do do well is that whenever they release a new camera, everything that's kind of come out up to that point goes in the new camera regardless of its price point. So it's getting uh, all the new, the, like the new video priority displays with the touch functions. It's got log shooting mode, user LUTs, the improved clear image zoom so that you don't lose subject detection and that kind of thing when you're zooming in with clear image zoom, which is actually pretty important. You now get the self timer for video, AI auto framing, which is sort of a cool feature if you, you know, a self shooter where it kind of follows you around the frame based on where it's auto focusing. Crops, it crops in and then follows that crop around inside the frame. Focus breathing compensation that complaint I made about them not updating old cameras, but obviously these cameras get everything that came with it. They really haven't pulled any punches at all when it comes to features. The only thing it doesn't have, but no cameras have, is some of those like vlogging features that were in the ZV-E1 that only that camera have, like dynamic active and that kind of stuff. That's still only that camera, but all the rest of the AI stuff is on this one. The A7CR does have another limitation though, and it's video resolution. So it's not 8K, there's no 8K functionality. They basically just sort of disabled it uh, in the camera, probably because the A7 R5 8K, you know, had some caveats. So putting in the smaller body was probably just a non-starter. So it's now 4K 60 max. All the same sort of quirky crops and when it's pixel binning and when it's, you know, oversampling stuff still apply. So uh, anything that's full frame, isn't going to be oversampling from 61 megapixels, but then you can switch to APS-C mode and you'll get that 6.2K oversampling. And the other modes, it you know either crops a little bit and then like bins what's left over or bins the full image, at, you know, depending on your frame rate. So those things still apply, the 24 versus 60 and then the APS-C up to 30 frames per second, just no 8K. But let's talk about overheating and all those different modes. So 
First thing I did is I put the A7C2 against the A7 IV in sort of a head-to-head -head test to see if there was any differences in thermal performance in my studio. Now the conditions were identical because I wanted to eliminate any variables. So they had the same battery, the same card, the same lens, they were using the same mount system, I had the same settings in camera, everything was exactly identical. They were both shot at the same time, so the ambient was the same, which was about 22 Celsius or 72 Fahrenheit. I had the heat threshold set to high on both cameras, the LCD screen was flipped out, and autofocus was enabled, and I had them tracking my face on this TV, so they were both shooting the same subject with the same amount of compression, and they were both required to do the same eye tracking. I suppose the only difference is that the A7 C2 has the AI processing unit when it comes to subject detection where the A7 IV didn't, which might explain the battery life discrepancy that I saw because at 4K24, both cameras ran until their battery died, which with no overheating warnings whatsoever. But it was sooner on the A7 C2. Uh, for A7 C2, I got two hours, almost two hours exactly. And on the A7 IV was two hours and 17 minutes. So it seems like the extra you know, bells and whistles do seem to cost you some battery life. It could also be that maybe because it's smaller, the battery's closer to the heat generating components, which warms up the battery more and then reduces the battery life. But either way, 217 versus two hours. And they were using the same generation of battery, both fully charged too, and I ran that test twice. And then I connected power delivery to the cameras and ran the test again, but this time at 4K60, just to see power delivery caused any issues, if uh, 4K60 was more demanding, even though 4K60 is now in an APS-C crop, so it's not oversampling from the 7K. So really 4K60 might actually be easier to do than 4K24 for the camera. But either way, um, first off, let me just say that that power delivery performance was excellent. So the batteries didn't even lose 1% over the entire run with power delivery connected. So I really like where we're at now with USB power delivery in these cameras. It's definitely, I think, a better option than a dummy battery. You might as well leave the battery in, hook up power delivery. When when it shuts off, you still got the battery back up. And you don't you like it doesn't even it didn't even go down by 1% the entire run. And that run was uh close to 2.5 hours, 4K60 uh with power delivery. So what I can say regarding the A7C2 is that in a climate controlled environment, I did not see a functional difference when it comes to overheating between this and the A7 IV meaning that I can record for as long as I want without any issues, basically. Now, obviously, that is going to change in hotter ambient temperatures, and that's gonna require more testing. But luckily, if you watch the tour of Gamers Nexus that I just did, Steve offered to help with some, you know, much more methodical data when it comes to camera overheating tests. So maybe we'll start doing that. And if we do do that, we'll add these cameras to the list so we can see how they stack up. Let me know in the comments if it's something you'd be interested in. Uh, now, when it comes to using this camera as a webcam or live streaming, I was able to get it to overheat. If you run it at 4K30 and record simultaneously, which is an option, I mean, even in a 22C environment, I was getting like 30 to 40 minutes. That really cooks it up. But if you don't record internally and you just do a 4K30 Zoom call or a live stream, I did notice that, you know, up to the first hour or so, nothing. And if I let it run for about two hours, then I did get a warning on the screen. It didn't shut down, but I did start to get a warning. So if heat is a concern, then you can always pop it in 1080p mode and it'll last longer. But then you won't be able to, you know, show off your incredible 4K video quality to all the other plebs on your Zoom call. It actually looks pretty good. Here, let me show you an example of it. Okay, so here you go. I just set this up in like two minutes. It's the A7C2. I grabbed that 16 to 35 G Master 2, put it on there, put it on a little Manfrotto tripod, plugged it in USB-C in the computer, opened up OBS, pressed record, here you go. I, I mean, it's not lit well or anything. I just, you know, I'm just under the the house lights. But uh, but I think I'm looking at an OBS, and I think the like the video quality is fantastic. This is the the 4K 30 mode here. Uh, yeah. So I mean, it's great to have that as a feature. Like I said, if you want to flex on everybody else in your Zoom call. But while I have you here, allow me a minute to tell you about today's sponsor, Storyblocks, in all this great webcam fidelity. So Storyblocks is a stock media platform that boasts a massive library of high quality assets aimed to strengthen your video production. Their subscription model provides predictable costs without any pay per clip pricing. Just pick a plan, pay that fee, and that's it. And you'll enjoy unlimited downloads of HD and 4K video files, images, and motion graphics templates. And the platform is intuitive and easy to use and new content is added regularly with a focus on in-demand keywords to make sure that you have access to updated assets to satisfy your project. And if you're an Adobe Creative Cloud user, you can now access the entire Storyblocks library right in Premiere Pro or After Effects by installing a clever little plugin, which can really speed up your workflow. 
And whether it's those motion graphics or the high quality stock footage, remember that with Storyblocks, anything you download is 100% royalty free forever with no restrictions on where you can distribute your projects. So to get started with unlimited stock media downloads at one set price, head to storyblocks.com slash undone or just click the link in the description. Now, when it comes to the A7CR and overheating, I don't have an A7R5 to do that same sort of head-to-head -head test with. So instead I just ran it on its own, but in the exact same conditions that I did the other camera, same lens, same memory card, same battery, same setup, same target, everything, exactly the same. In 4K60 on this camera, which again is sort of the, the most intensive non-oversampled mode, I guess, I recorded for two hours with no heat warnings, camera died due to battery life. So it seems like the battery life is about the same between these two cameras. Now it's about two hours. Then I ran the test again, but in APS-C mode, which is that 6.2K oversampled one. And I added power delivery into the mix too to see how that would affect things. And I still managed to record for nearly two hours before I just shut it down because it was bored. Uh, again, with no overheating warnings. So when it comes to a controlled studio environment, I don't have any concerns with either of these cameras using any of their record modes. But again, more intense thermal testing is required for me to make any recommendations about people using it in hotter environments. Let's do a little quick summary on these two cameras, wrap it up, and then we'll move over to the lens, uh, which I have things to say about that that make me kind of angry. But uh, okay, so when it comes to A7C2, basically it's a slightly worse viewfinder, but same LCD, improved IBIS, and they added more features like the AI chip, better autofocus, the LUTs, auto framing, the better streaming codec, just a whole bunch of nice quality of life updates over the A7 IV, and it's cheaper than the A7 IV. I think uh, in my briefing they said it's gonna be like two or $300 less than what the A7 IV is selling for now. So because it performs just as well in a studio environment for me where, you know, like the viewfinder doesn't really matter, uh, you know, I'm just putting it on a tripod and shoot myself. It's just a cheaper version of the a7 IV. And the a7 IV was already, you know, one of my sort of favorite choices for YouTube A-roll for the money. Well, now this is, this is better. It's cheaper. So if it's doing the same job for cheaper, that's a win, right? And it's even got, like I said, some extra features in there, which is nice. Um, for the, so this is just, this is an overall great, great product in my opinion. For the A7CR, it's a bit more challenging because it's still considerably cheaper than the A7R5, which is great, obviously, uh, but you're giving up a, a few of the aspects that makes the A7R5 kind of special, which would be that you know crazy flip screen thing, the really impressive viewfinder, and to a lesser extent, you could say things like 8K recording, which is uh, absent, and the phenomenal image stabilization. I haven't, again, I can't do a side-by-side -side comparison in terms of IBIS between this camera and the A7R5, um, but the A7R5's IBIS is great. So, you know, even giving up a little bit of that does feel a little bit, a little bit of a pain point. But it's still a much more affordable entry position to this sensor for somebody who maybe doesn't care about those other things. So if you want that A7R5 sensor with the AI processing chip, this is the cheapest way you're gonna be able to get it. But it doesn't have the same magic of the a7r5 now moving on to the lens which like i said is kind of an interesting thing sony announcing and releasing not releasing but like uh, the the embargo the announcement of this lens at the same time as the cameras is frustrating they did this last time with the a6700 and the 7200 f4 lenses are kind of more important than cameras you know you, if you buy this lens you're going to have it probably longer than you're going to have bodies especially with how quickly sony puts out bodies and sometimes the lenses are, are pretty neat. That 7200 f4 was, was neat, but I only had time to make that sort of in-depth review on the a6700, so I didn't even cover the lens. And as a YouTuber, posting two videos at the exact same time isn't good for us. It's not good for the audience because they're not going to watch them all necessarily. It's not good for, like, one's going to get buried. And what I can tell you from views is that cameras beat lenses in terms of uh, just, you know, engagement. So these cameras are going to come out and this lens is going to come out and I think the lenses are gonna bury, I think the cameras are gonna bury the lens a little bit, which is annoying because a 16 to 35 G Master 2 has been something I've seen a lot of requests for. Now I do actually have a few comparison images for you and we'll pull them up on the screen in a second. I don't wanna bore you with too much pixel peeping because we're literally comparing like pretty similar lenses here. But uh, build quality, it does have some differences. So here's the, um, can we see this in this shot? Here's the original GM1, here's the GM2. You can see it's a little bit smaller. When you extend the, the barrel, there's a bigger bigger extension on the Mark I. And this is also changing, you can feel the balance change more 
on the original than you do on the new one, which means that if you're a gimbal user and you're like a 16-35, this is going to throw off your balance less than the original did. And it's lighter. Uh, it's actually considerably lighter. I, I, often I put numbers up, but it's like the numbers don't mean anything. I'm telling you that like when it comes to holding it at the back, this one's got much more of a tip to it. If you've ever used a 16-35, this is lighter, smaller, extends less, balances better. That's a win-win. And then really in terms of changes, there's not a lot other than they've added a second. You can see here, uh, the GM1 just has the one function button and obviously no aperture ring, just an AF MF switch. With this one, they have the aperture ring, you have the ability to click it on or off, and it has an iris lock. And it also has more than one function button. You got one here and one here. Same front filter thread, which is 82 millimeters. I'm pretty confident. Yeah, it's 82 millimeters. Uh, but they have improved the minimum focus distance, which is nice as well. So overall, build quality wise, it's a better lens, as you would expect. The rings feel a little bit, a little bit nicer too, a little bit better dampened. It's all linear, linear manual focus, but with a shorter throw. And it's got, you know, the XD linear motors in it. So the focus is super fast. And they actually, I think they claim something in the, in the briefing, like, oh, it's, you know, focus is 10% faster or something than this one. I don't know if you're going to notice that in, in the real world, but, uh, but it's, it's, it's just better. It's better in every way. Um, but what will happen is the price will probably get reduced on this one. And so then it'll be more expensive as well, you know, cause this will come out at the, at the sort of full price of a 1635 and then this one will get reduced. Um, let's look at some images though. All right. So this is kind of cool. First time doing this practically. So you can see the tight shot here, but then the wide shot shows that screen behind me, which is a duplicate of the screen I'm looking at that I can control wirelessly from here. And we can pixel peep all together now. I don't know, I don't know what I'm doing. Anyway, let's take a look here. So uh, G Master 1 is on the left and G Master 2 is on the right. And this is to just show a couple different things. So if we punch in, let's, let's zoom in quite a bit here. Uh, you can see that they're, it's slightly sharper on the one on the right, which is the G Master 2, which makes sense. But also when it comes to chromatic aberration, as we go to the side here, you can see, you can see a little bit of like a blue line, a blue fringe running here, and there's not much fringing at all on the GM2. So little improvements like that. The further out that we go, the more, ooh, look at that, there's like a weird hair in the shot. <laughs> I didn't notice that on the table. It's like an eyelash. Um, and the eyelash is sharper on the GM2. Uh, but that's what I was gonna say, as we go to the side, the fringing gets worse. This The distortion and skewing is kind of worse, and this was, at the one end of the focal length, let's switch over to the other one, like this, and still GM2 is still on the right. Again, you can see that it's there's more detail in the one on the right, and uh, it maintains that detail as we go to the edge. This one's a little bit of a closer call on uh, on the other end of the focal length, focal range, but uh, yeah, just slightly sharper, a little bit less fringing. I mentioned that the close, like the maximum reproduction is actually greater because you can you can close focus better. On the GM1, it was uh, 0.28 meters or 0.92 feet. And on the GM2, it's 0.22 meters, I think now. Yeah, 0.22 meters or 0.73 feet. So you get closer, but you're still maintaining 35 millimeters, means this is the difference. So this is what it looks like as close as you can get on the GM1, and this is what it looks like, the same Rogue's Cube, as close as you can get on the GM2. And then lastly, I just did a couple checks on focus breathing, in case you're still using a camera that Sony never gave focus breathing compensation to. The GM1 breathed a little bit. Yeah, I don't know if it's a huge deal when it comes to practical use case, but it did breathe a little bit. Uh, the GM2 has significantly reduced the focus breathing, which you can see on this little tape measure I've got here, how much of the tape measure is kind of appearing and disappearing as you focus from minimum to infinity, the GM2 does a better job of that. So, you know, it's minor improvements. There are improvements that matter though, you know, better chromatic aberration performance, better sharpness, less distortion, uh, better focus breathing, you know, like all these things are are relevant. The build quality is better. It's got more features and functions on it, but, but like a lot of the sort of GM2 versions that have come out, I don't know that I would rush out and sell my current GM1 to buy GM2 if you were going to do that at a significant loss. But if you were shopping for a 16 to 35 now, or were waiting for the update, or you're new, you just started getting your Sony cameras, you're looking for what lenses to get, the GM2 is the clear winner between the two of them. And that's that's the one to buy in 2023 moving onward. I just don't know that it's a massive upgrade if you're thinking about switching. Anyway, that's about it. What do you think of this announcement? 
You know, is it sort of a minor one for you? Are you interested in these compact cameras and just in the GM2 16 to 35? Let me know in the comments what you think, if you're excited or not. And yeah, thanks for watching. Thanks for sort of helping me test out the new the new setup here. I'm still switching my eyes from one camera to another. I'm gonna figure that out. Anyway. All right. I'm done.